Okay. So uh, welcome. Um, first of all, let's just start with your questions. Uh, who wants to start with his or her question? Does anybody have any question from uh, from the past semester that we studied together? Uh, different concepts of leadership and uh, you know all the topics. So, are there any parts that you need uh, further explanation, or you have a question on one or few topics that you want to discuss? Please uh, go ahead and ask your question. Yes, that's correct. You have two uh, like parts to your assignment, and they are ten pages each. So that is correct. You could you could write more, uh, but I would rather have ten pages. Like ten pages are is a, is a good safe number for the number of pages. So, uh, Mr. Kakar, if your assignment is less than 20 pages, I would suggest just revising it and resubmitting. You still have two weeks from now, uh, so I would definitely resubmit. That's correct. Microsoft Word, A4 pages, or letter letter pages, uh, is the right. Two weeks from now, so today is January 8th, so two weeks would be Sorry, today is January 6th, so January 20th would be your, your last date of submission. January 20th. So by, by 12 midnight, I your 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 assignment should be submitted already. Okay. Any questions? Any comments or questions from the semester from topics from the course from for the assignment. Feel free to ask your questions. And if you don't have any questions for now, we can start uh, watching uh, the first video clip, which is a short one. It's only five minutes, almost five minutes. And then uh, come back and do a discussion together and also see if you guys have any questions. Before we start, do we have any questions? And John wouldn't...
Okay. Uh, I see. See a question here. Okay. Uh, the question we have from Mr. Kakar. John Wooden uh, basically is a. He's a coach, he's a basketball coach, and his book is his lifetime experiences on coaching and leading. So uh, looking at that book, actually, it's basically it's the other way around, and I believe it's uh, more on uh, telling you that leaders are not necessarily born leaders, but uh, they are... Uh, they, they they basically they strive and uh, the the effort and commitment is the is the key. So uh, and Steve Jobs, uh, uh, despite the talents that he had, uh, he basically he earned a lot of those credits. Uh, like those leadership credits were earned. A lot of them were obtained through the years of experience and hard work. So, and if you remember, watch the clip uh, of his, uh, his his speech. He was saying that he left Apple. He was actually fired from the company uh, first, and then came back. So, uh, basically, what you'll understand and see is uh, he not necessarily was born a leader or a successful man, but he he strived uh, through uh, all those hurdles and. He managed to succeed. So, uh, in my mind, leaders are not born. I, 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 I think I mentioned that in the first session that leaders are not born leaders. They, they basically obtain those skills, and leadership skills are obtained through the years. So, we definitely uh, want to do that. Uh, okay, so that, uh, I hope, answers your question. It's uh, John Wooden has a great book uh, called the, uh, the Essentials uh, 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 A Lifetime of Lessons on Leadership and Leaders and Leadership. So that's a good book and basically shares some of these experiences. They are created. Yeah, to some extent they are born with certain talents. Everybody is. But but definitely they they learn a lot of those skills and it's not that they have it from day one. Yeah, okay. So then the next question now says first section which is little well, possible to write ten pages on such a small topic. Okay, Mr. Wardick, uh the first session is basically it's not a small topic. Uh Steve Jobs is a is a very interesting character and for him as a leader, uh, basically there there have been there has been books published with oh, like hundreds of pages. So basically, it's not a small topic. You're talking about uh, uh, a leader, and you're trying to discuss uh, like he is uh, leadership uh, development. So I I'm, I I could imagine. First of all, there are plenty of uh, like resource out there online or in the libraries, you can, you can study a lot, and there are several pages that you can study about. And then uh, for you to write about it, it's not a small topic; it's uh, it's actually a big topic. And for you to be able to address it in ten page, I think it's uh, it's pretty simple. It's not a, a small topic. Yeah. Steve Jobs is a leader, and what you will do is you will study those and you try to uh, address the question here, which is you will use examples to argue uh, like how uh, the Steve Jobs will fit in any of those leadership characteristics that we discussed. Which one of them? Like if you want to talk about. Uh, a visionary, like the, the leader who has 
a vision, how he helped uh, the company to succeed, how how his leadership skills were helping. Uh, and actually, there's a there's a book on uh, Steve Jobs that uh, could really be helpful. Uh, like there are several books. Basically, there is a there is a biography of it. Yeah, Steve Jobs' biography that was published by a friend of his, and Steve Jobs' biography. Uh, so I would I would use that book for our several plenty of like information there that we can definitely use. So. Uh, that is for your question. Yeah, it's very true, Mr. Kakar. He did he, he uh like one thing that uh uh you know Steve Jobs his exemplar is as you mentioned, he's not uh he was he was not very educated. He was adopted, and all those leadership qualities were obtained through the years with like uh, surmounting the challenges that he faced. So uh, he he basically managed to to survive all those challenges and master them. Okay, uh, so. Uh, any other questions before we watch the, the, the clip? Okay then, so we watch the first clip and then come back, do a discussion and then probably watch another uh, clip. Uh, so this, this clip that we want to watch now is uh, from uh, Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins is a uh, basically mm, consultant and is a coach uh, who talks about many different topics. One of the topics that he has focused on uh, in the past, past few years is uh, is leadership. So uh, this uh, this is like a uh, sort of a uh, a conference or a forum, and that he basically just answering questions at this part uh, so let's just let's just view it together okay One of the things I wanted to ask you, like on the first day, is you said, like to my friend over here, you got to lead your people. You got to learn enough about the job that you hate and then lead them. And what I wanted to ask you is, well, being it's sort of on the front lines of things, how do you actually, what are your ideas on leadership? And you gave some examples today. Like, for example, you sort of come up with a plan and then you ask the questions. So that's one strategy. That's only one part, yes. I was wondering if you could share maybe a two or three more. Sure, I mean, I would do. My number one belief about leadership is you're a servant. But here's what I mean. Here's what I mean specifically. The word hero, hero, that is in the archetype of like men and you and I. I bet. Is it true that inside of you you want you really want to be the best? You want to create the best, share the best, do the best? Is that a, is that a metaphor for you in your life? Absolutely. Yeah, me too. So I think people in this room tend to have that as a metaphor. So all of us, at some level, man or woman, wants to be a hero. The word hero in its Latin root means servo. Servo means servant. It actually means slave. The hero, why they're the hero is becoming the ultimate servant to something larger than themselves, people and so forth. The person who thinks they're going to lead by demand or by position, 
can only be for a short period of time. With the person whose idea is serving it, my belief is if you can find a way to take any group of people and help them to experience their needs at a richer, deeper level than anyone else, then together you guys can get anything done. Anything. Now, it may not work the first time, but together you can get to that point. Because needs are ultimately what we're after. We're not after the vehicle we think we're after. You want a billion dollars, then you get it. I got plenty of clients, and I will tell you, it is not the end game. And so then they go after their second billion. Or you think it's getting married, and then you get it, and you find out it's not the end game. There's certain needs that have to be there, and the ultimate needs are growing and giving. Because you only can feel so good filled up by yourself. So my core belief is i got to serve. If I serve, I can lead. Because I believe motive does matter. If my motive is just to get you to do something for me, there's a certain amount of power that I can get to do that if I strategize, if I think, if I feel, and also if it serves a greater good, even if I don't intend it. If the bumblebee goes to try to get the nectar it wants, its selfish goal, I believe there's a higher power that guides it all. And when that bumblebee goes, it doesn't intend to give anything, but pollen sticks to its legs. As it goes about trying to get what it wants, that's how flowers are created. I really believe that everything has a web of connection. If your intent is to serve yourself, you're still going to serve something more than yourself, and you're going to get a certain amount of insight. If your intent and your motive is to serve something yourself, but also something more, just your kids, then I believe you get a different level of insight. And because you're serving more of what serves life, not just me, it's me and my family. If you're trying to serve a community, I believe you get a different level of insight. If you're trying to serve humanity, you get a different level of insight. I get emotional feedback because this is why I do what I do. So when someone stands up, it's not about business, it's not about anything, but about serving them. So I will use abrasive or creative language. I'll use whatever it takes, humor, stupidity. I'll make fun of myself. I'll challenge. I'll do anything to serve. That's why I'm here. I don't need to do what I love to see someone free and alive and lit up. So when that's your motive, no matter how people perceive you on the outside, if they're around you long enough, you can't hide what your real motive is. And they'll see it, and they'll feel it. Motive does matter. If it's to serve something high, it'll be there. That doesn't mean you don't get served, too. And in business, you've got to be served. Or I used to do business, and I lose money in the business, and everybody else was happy. And it was wonderful, except I had no business. So it's, you know, killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. So I've learned to put that balance in. But that gives me... Power. That's why time disappears for me, because I'm not about getting some action done. I'm about the outcomes. Question. You know, we, we, uh, we talk about, you know, the economy being real rough going yes. forward. But you've given so much of yourself, and I can see it, and the passion behind these people about teaching these really important business principles, that I'm confident that it's going to be a lot shorter to come out of this recession. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Give me a hand. So, uh, we, we just watched uh, the video by, uh, by Tony Robbins, who was answering the question of one of the uh, participants about leadership. So, what is leadership? So, uh, first of all, uh, what do you think about it? Uh, any comments or questions? So, if there's no question, I'm going to ask you a question. So, what is... Yeah, that's true. So, basically, uh, what, what you could conclude from what he was saying, like leader uh, could be a hero, but in a sense that he's He's going to be serving, serving the community or 
or uh, whatever group that he's leading. So uh, leading and leadership is not necessarily just bossing him around and telling him what to do and what not to do. Uh, so my question to you is, what is the uh, basically benefit of serving leadership and why is it important for a leader to serve the team he or she is leading? Okay, so my question to you is, yeah, please go ahead and talk about it, Mr. Kalkar. Uh, would you like to just activate your uh, microphone? Please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, the reason I said uh, I, I like his speech about hero uh, is it was almost making sense with our religion here, um, as uh, it is very common, and it said in the uh, um, uh, in our local language that hero is the one uh, who is serving others. It's exactly the same which came in our <laughs> in our books too, um, and that is because if you are serving people, you are becoming their leader. You are becoming their their hero. And uh, the way he mentioned that you can be the best, uh, and uh, and you can create the best. Uh, and that's that's telling us that like a good a hero could be created or or, or a leader could be also created here this is something i i got out of it out of it however i would i would read the the arabic of what i mentioned before like it said in arabic sayyidul qawmi khadimuhum the person who is the hero he is the servant so uh, and because of what he served he became the hero Oh, okay, thank you very much for sharing your views. Uh, very interesting, thank you. So, uh, then uh, the question here is why, uh, what is the benefit of serving leadership and why is it important for a leader to serve a team that's leading? So, uh, who wants to answer that question? Okay. Who's going to answer the question about uh, the benefit? So, or basically, I want all the answers. Uh, serving the team will motivate the team. It will support the leader. It's a monetary family organization. Goal will be achieved. Yes, motivation will be uh, created and uh, team members will be inspired. So that's very true. Uh, there are many benefits, and one of them is leader don't serve and don't become servant, and never be a good leader. Okay. And why is uh, so, uh, Mr. Fakar? Never motivate people. Okay, that's true. Okay. How about others? Uh, I want to have everybody's answer on the question. People let people be false and trust people. Yeah, that's true. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, leadership is basically based on trust and the relationship you create with your team members. So if they trust you, you'll be able to. Uh, you know, impact them and influence them in getting things done. 
and you'll be able to lead them because they trust you. They have you have their trust, and that will help you to move forward, get a lot of things done. Because relationships are basically based on trust, and if they don't trust you, how could they follow your leadership? Okay, so let's uh, watch a little bit of the other clip and then uh, we will finish our discussion. Uh, let's just watch. Okay. You are among the most capable members of your generation. You're the best that our society has to offer. And you represent our hopes for the future of world leadership and the impact that can have on how our organizations perform and how they serve society. So a chance to offer my views on leadership, on a view from the top, is just a rare opportunity and a great privilege. I thought as a, a view from the top, it seemed logical to address these two questions. What's the top? And what's the view like? <laughs> Here's my definition of the top. Look, it's any position where you take responsibility for a group with a mission to fulfill. It's any job, any role, any position. You take responsibility, you feel it, and you own it, and it's the group that has an important mission to fulfill. And when you take that definition and you look at modern organizations in our society today, you realize there's many, many places within an organization that you, in fact, can take responsibility for a group. Most of us start our working lives working for ourselves and are responsible for our own work. But pretty soon, you already have, or I know you will, will be responsible for a group of people, a team of people, and their work. And that group may change over time to become a group of other managers who in turn have their own team. Or your group may be a group of a business function or corporate function like HR or strategy or finance. It may be a business where you've got a group of customers and employees and you've got products and a geography to cover. In bigger organizations, it might even be a group of businesses. It might even be an entire enterprise. There are lots of tops that are possible. I left the GSB a little over 40 years ago, and I worked for four big institutions. And during that time, I was fortunate to have 10 chances at a top. And they ranged, as indicated in that earlier chart, from small groups to large groups, from line to staff, from businesses to corporate or business functions, sometimes groups of businesses, and in a couple of occasions, the entire enterprise. I'm never quite sure where to put the business school because in addition to having faculty and staff of about 500, we have 900 students seeking degrees. We have 2,500 students coming for executive education that are a little different from staff and different from customers. And we have seven schools at the university, so I put it kind of as a business. But all of these tops have the same thing in common. You're responsible for a group of people with a mission to fulfill, 
and you're trying to change that group for the better. Now, what I should say at the outset is that just because your job sits at the top of an organization chart, there's a reality to how groups work that is often a surprise to people. For example, 10 years ago when the GSB Dean Search Committee, almost 10 years to this month, invited me to be the dean and I accepted that invitation, they presented me with a t-shirt that had the following diagram across the front. <laughs> now, while this is not exactly how the GSB works, I knew at the time, and I know even more today, as I've thought about and studied and tried to teach about leadership, that really in virtually all of these tops, in all leadership roles, there's, there's an informal dependence on other people that is in many ways much more important and more powerful than the power or the authority that is implied by an organization chart that puts your job at the top. Because here's the reason. It's all about responsibility. When you're at the top, it's not about power or fame or fortune. It's about responsibility. You're responsible for the group. You're responsible uh, for moving that group in the right direction over time so that it gets better. And you're the only one that has that total responsibility across all dimensions, all parts of the group, how the group acts, how it thinks, how it feels, how it performs. That's something you can't do alone. And that's something you really can't do with power. I always like what Margaret Thatcher had to say about power. She said, you know, being powerful is like being a lady. If you have to say you are, you aren't. <laughs> I thought that would sink in. That's what the top is all about. It's about responsibility. It's about 24-7 responsibility for the group with what Abram Zelnick called an impelling need to do better. So what about the view? What's it like? Well, let me say four things about the view. First of all, since you're at the top and you're responsible for the, view, for the group, you better have a view. You better develop a view. That is to say, where is the group now, and where would you like to see the group headed? In what direction and at what speed? Groups need direction. They need some kind of vision for what better looks like if you're trying to change for the better, which you are. I always thought Michael Dell had a great way of expressing it. He said, you have to show that you know the way, even if you have no idea what to do. And it's true, you have to know a general sense of direction about where the group ought to go. It's not something you have to do alone, it has to get developed. It's not something you have to do in your first hundred days, but you have to see that the group does have a sense of direction and that it's there. And it's one of the two things when you're at a top that you just can't delegate. This is one of those things you have to make sure happens. A group needs a strategy, it needs a framework that guides the choices that determine its nature and direction. And as the person responsible at the top, you're in the best position to have the best view of where it ought to go. When I went to Australia in 1993, as Brett mentioned, I saw a very troubled institution that suffered the biggest loss in Australian corporate history. And they have tried to be Australia's World Bank. But it's a big world out there, lots of risks resources aren't there to really do that. I could see that if it really focused on being Australia's best bank, the best bank in Australia for Australians, the best bank in New Zealand for New Zealanders, that was its home turf where it had been for nearly 200 years, but it could be a really successful institution. And I also could see, because I spent 22 years at Wells Fargo trying to be the best bank in California, that it was possible. I knew how products and systems and 
and, and groups could come together. But I didn't actually know how to do it in this different country, in this different culture, with different laws and people. But I had a general sense of direction. When I came to the Stanford Business School in 1999, I knew it was a great school, but I also knew it could be better. I thought particularly we could be better along the dimensions of preparing people for global management and for leadership, but I didn't really know how or how we might do that. So you have to have a view, a view and you have to then help others see what it is that you see when you take that view because there's no sense having a vision or a view if you can't make it happen. You've got to turn, turn that vision into reality. And there are a couple of ways that you can help yourself do that. You can push the group along through the implementation of really useful, really valuable and important management systems. Planning, organizing, staffing, directing, controlling, these are all things I've found extraordinarily valuable, whether in a bank or in a school. They help you push the group in the right direction. They bring a discipline and a focus to the organization that's extremely valuable. And they have a lot to do with how the group acts, but they have very little to do, to do with how it thinks or how it feels. To do that, you've got to pull the group along, and that takes communication, a lot of communication. John Gardner had a wonderful phrase, leaders find the words. And you have to find words that connect with people. Um, you have to help others see what it is that you see, and you try different things until something clicks or connects or works. It's no good talking to people about being the best bank in Australia if nobody knows what that means. It's better to find a way to explain it in terms of developing or delivering better solutions for customers day in and day out, so they begin to see how their job fits with their role in the firm. It's no good talking about being a great school if it's too generous too general and, and not giving people some sense of direction. It's better to talk about the three C's of the new curriculum, new collaboration, or a new campus. You have to enlist followers when you're in a role at the top, and you're very dependent on those followers. What you want are people who are inspired, who are committed, who are motivated, and it's your job to instill confidence in them. That's very hard to do. Change is hard, and most people resist change, and yet the group needs change to get better. They need to know what's in it for them to make that change, and earning followers is earning their trust. You earn their trust by being trustworthy. Jack Welch always says, look, at the top, it's not about you, it's about them. This is so true. And in particular, it's about the relationship between you and them. And in developing that relationship, I'd say the third thing about the view is you have to figure out how it's going. There are management systems that are really helpful, but when you're at the top, people don't always tell you what you need to hear. Indeed, that's probably the single biggest blind spot or difficulty when you're in a role like that. And here's where the power of questions from the top is probably even more important than the view from the top. Ron Heifetz, who's a leadership scholar at the Kennedy School, has a wonderful phrase that one can lead with no more than a question in hand. Sometimes it's as simple a question as, why do we do it that way? Or I can recall going into a very, very large group of managers in my early days at Westpac. It was entirely filled with middle-aged men, and I said, where are all the women? It wasn't really a question that needed an answer. It was a question that set in motion a whole change in behavior, not just in our company, but throughout corporate Australia. So the power of a question is pretty extraordinary. You have to invite open criticism. We have to be willing to invite open criticism. There are all kinds of ways to do this, and I've tried them all. Managing by walking around, town halls where you encourage people to speak up, uh, confidential surveys of staff or employees or, or, or customers, uh, hotlines where 
of the things we did at Westpac in the early days was the first Friday of every month, any employee in the company could pick up the phone between 9 and 10 and call the CEO. And I found that if two or three people referred to a similar problem, you could pretty much be sure it was a problem. That's all it took. Out of 40,000 people, if there were two or three courageous souls who called and they were triangulating on the same issue, the chances were pretty good that there was a real problem there that was so valuable to know about and cut off that you never knew from the management systems. You've got to invite the open criticism and you've got to listen, and listen really well. When you're at the top, you need to understand the world of customers and staff. What's it like to be a customer in your organization? What's it like to be a staff member? How are they thinking and how are they feeling? And people need to know that you understand their world. If they're going to trust you, you need their trust to make the changes that are so important for the good of the group. Because if the group doesn't change, it falls behind. And the last thing I'd say about the view is you have to be the view. And this is perhaps the most surprising thing to people. This is the second thing you can't delegate. Because you're at the top, you are the group's representative. You're the symbol of the group. You stand for the group everywhere you go and everything you do. Leaders cast long shadows. You hear the phrase, the tone at the top. And indeed, the tone at the top is more important, perhaps, than the view from the top. You need to earn the trust and respect of people so they'll follow and want to make the changes. Um, people will trust and follow, not a perfect leader. They don't want a perfect leader, a genuine leader, somebody they can trust. Somebody who demonstrates that they care more about the group and the group's welfare than about the welfare of the leader. This was really brought home to me by a very sad incident in Australia when one of our staff members in New Zealand, a member uh, of our branch in a little branch outside of Wellington, was shot and killed during a bank holdup. It's the first time in my entire career I'd ever been involved with a fatality in a place I worked. And we were all extremely distraught and concerned. And my HR director came in and said, well, you're going to the funeral, aren't you? And I said, oh, I don't think so. I think I'd be kind of awkward there. I mean, I don't know the people. This is a very sad situation for their family. I'm intruding on their privacy. Oh, no, he said, you have to go. It made me a little uncomfortable, but the more he pushed, the more I listened, and the more I decided maybe he's right and I'd better go. And I learned for myself just how important the symbol of the organization communicates to the family who are so grateful and pleased, uh, to 7,000 staff in New Zealand who were so grateful and pleased. In a way, I couldn't possibly have imagined I only really came to see it years later when after 9-11 I was reading Rudy Giuliani's book on leadership and it came to chapter 11. And the title of chapter 11 is Weddings Discretionary, Funerals Mandatory. And in that chapter Giuliani talks about when things are going great, the leader doesn't have to show up. It's when people are hurting and things are not so good that they need leadership. In other words, you have to find ways to use all of yourself. Your words, your deeds, your emotions, your energy to build that relationship. It's, it's not about you, it's about them. It's about a relationship between you and them. And in building that relationship, you've got to use all of yourself. John Gardner used to remind me that leadership is not a science, it's an art. And it's a performing art. And in this performing art, he said, you are the instrument. And you need to know how to play that instrument and play it well. You have to be the change 
that you want to see in the organization. Just as Gandhi told us, be the change you want to see in the world. When you're at the top and in that role and you want to see the organization operate in a certain way, you have to be the change that you want to see in others. The role model that people copy. People want to have a sense of hope. They need that. They need a sense of optimism. And they need to see it in you when you're at the top. Well, that's my view from the top and what it's like. But what about you and yours to come? Because there's not a doubt in my mind that you will be at top in your life. You will be involved in group effort, and at some point, you'll take responsibility for that group effort. I hope wherever you start in an organization that you start right away thinking about the top, thinking about how should this group change for the better? What does group success look like? I hope you'll accept responsibility for how well the group performs, whether it's in your job description or not. And when it really becomes part of your job description, that you'll then acquire the expertise that can only come from experience, the experience of actually assuming that top or that leadership responsibility. You know, the Chinese have a wonderful saying that I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. But I do and I understand. The deepest form of learning is understanding. It's why in our leadership fellows, we actually have people do. We have them take responsibility for others. We have them coach. We have them give feedback so they know what it feels like. So they understand leadership in a way you can't possibly learn from a lecture or from reading a book. And then when you're at the top, I hope that you will be yourself, be yourself, because you've got to be a genuine person of integrity to be effective. But you can be yourself with more skill. That's the great thing about life. You can continually learn by listening and practice and learning from mistakes and trying new behaviors. This is all made even more powerful if you're doing what matters most to you. If you're doing work that you think ought to be done and it ought to be done by you. And for each of you, that's a separate calling and a separate voice. The key thing is that you care about a group achieving a better future for itself. There's nothing more satisfying than being a part of such an effort where you care about a group achieving a better future and it indeed achieves a better future. I can tell you that, and I hope you have an opportunity to experience that. After all, if not you, who else? And if not now or soon after you leave this place, when? One of the great joys of being Dean is that I get to see over and over again in hundreds of ways the impact that this place has on the lives of people who go through this experience. For example, uh, in September when we broke ground over here on our new campus, Phil Knight talked at dinner and he said, you know, without the GSD, there'd be no Nike. Pretty powerful, amazing. And a couple of months ago, I was in London at, at a big Stanford alumni event chatting with one of our younger alums from Germany. And as I usually do to make conversation, I said, well, how's business? Expecting, hey, it's not so good. You know, the economy's in recession. Things are tough in Europe. And he said, things are really going well. Uh, and he told me about how he and a couple of partners had bought a few companies, small and medium-sized companies, and had turned them around revitalize them, uh, were really creating value and productivity was appearing. And he was so excited and he stopped and then sent looked at me and said, you know, without the Stanford GSC, I never would have had the confidence to do this. I thought, that's pretty great. You know, we don't have a course in confidence here. We, 
routine strategy, marketing, HR, operations, accounting, and finance. And, but there is a confidence that comes when you acquire a way of thinking and approaching situations and have tested it with other extremely bright people that lets you know that things are possible and that you can indeed play that kind of role. After all, it's your life that's the one changed by coming here. That's what we're talking about in this slogan. You're a different person when you leave here than when you entered. I see it now over and over again, 10 years in succession. And your work will involve working in groups. And those groups will be trying to fulfill missions. And those are missions, if done well, can change the world. Margaret Mead reminds us, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Now, I can give you my view from the top. If you hear me, you might forget. If you see me, you might remember. But remember, I do and I understand. You will only really understand if you do it, if you get involved in the doing, not talking, analyzing, thinking about, consulting about, investing, but doing. <laughs> Take on a leadership role. Be responsible for a group, helping that group to change for the better, to fulfill an important mission. That's where that confidence comes from that those guys are talking about. That's how you learn leadership. The only real learning for leadership is leadership, taking on a leadership role. It's all about the doing. So in the words of our great friend and alum, Phil Knight, please do it. Please do it. And I hope you'll do it with the intensity and the focus and putting all of yourself into it that I think you see in this young picture. Um, I can tell you, because I know him well and I watch him often, that he's not just putting his mind and body into this. He's putting his heart and soul into this. This is work that ought to be done, and he believes he ought to do it. And it's what matters most to him at that moment in time. I enjoy watching him, but I look forward just as much to watching you. As you assume your tops and you develop your views and you come back and share them with us, thank you very much for the honor of presenting my views from the top. Okay, everyone. So, uh, okay. So, what do you think about this uh, video that we watched? About uh, the views. Uh, the top, he mentioned this was uh, done in Stanford University, uh, so you know, was uh, he was discussing uh, the concept of your view, which is your vision that we have been talking about it since day one uh, in our course, and also the, the top, which is you as a leader, how you you basically are coordinating, serving, helping uh, your team members. Yeah, but I'm not showing it on YouTube, but uh, yeah, you were just watching it through my, my desktop, so you were able to watch it at home.
Okay. So uh, let's see if there's any questions. Any questions or comments? On, on these videos that we watched, or on the concepts we discussed, or uh, on the assignment. Yes, that's correct. That's exactly. And you're on the top. You take the responsibility for the group, and you have a vision, which is your view or vision. To, to fulfill and get obtain. So yeah, very nice. Any other comments or questions? Well, uh, basically, uh, we did discuss that in one of the sessions that uh, you as a leader should be the change you want to happen. So you should lead by example. Yes, exactly. So you do it first. When you tell your staff from today, I want everyone to, to write a report on their day's activity. You as a leader should be the first one to do so, and so they they see that okay, this is how it's done. So you do uh, what you ask them to do first. So you comply with that change, and you show them how it's done, and you would be the part of that change. Exactly, that's correct. And then you see, you will learn because that will stick to your mind. And I just, when, I, when your leader just tells you what to do and you don't see an example, it's much harder to remember when, uh, rather than when you, are, you see exactly with your eyes. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, looks like there's not many questions out there. Uh, okay, so uh, please make sure you submit your assignment, which is due in two weeks, both of them, uh, via email to me, by uh, January the 20th, midnight, and uh, and basically that's it for our leadership course. It was a great pleasure to have you guys in the class. I really enjoyed uh, uh, doing this class with you guys. I hope that uh, that helps uh, you and your career. And all these topics that we discuss are not just theories, and you can basically uh, apply them to your everyday career and I, I wish you luck and I hope I, I'll see you uh, in uh, my next classes during the next semester so good good luck to all of you and uh, have a wonderful week and uh, yes Mr. Summit yes I got your email thank you for the assignment so yeah uh, Thanks, everyone. Definitely, it was a pleasure. And uh, uh, all the best. So feel free to email me if you have any questions anytime, even after the semester. And please keep in touch. OK.